peace be with you <laughs> and welcome once again. Friends, this morning as a school community, we take extra time to enter the Easter week, when each day is treated as Easter itself. And as diverse as we are, it is good to pause and reflect on why there was a long weekend and what happened over the last few days. As Pope Francis said, resurrection resounds in the church the world over, along with the singing of Alleluia. Christ rose on the third day and the day we celebrated on Sunday. When the first witnesses of his resurrection, the women, entered the tomb, they heard a question, for whom are you looking? These words heard by the women at the tomb are also addressed to us. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus is not there, but he has risen. Death, solitude, and fear are not the last words. However, there is a word that transcends them, a word that only God can speak. It is the word of the resurrection. Christ is truly risen. Alleluia. Now great for the gift of life and for the empty tomb, let us begin. In the name of the Father, of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, who through your Son, Jesus, have conquered death and unlocked for us the path of eternity, grant, we pray, that we who keep the solemnity of Lord's resurrection may rise up in the light of life. Amen. Now let us listen to the word of God proclaimed by Giselle. A reading from the Gospel according to St. John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. The other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, but that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni. Thank you, Giselle. You see, dear friends, if it wasn't for the resurrection of Christ, then Christianity in all its form would not survive. So why does the resurrection of Christ matter? Let us take a few minutes and hear about it from Bishop Robert Barron. Well, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the be-all and the end-all of Christian faith. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then I and other bishops and priests and Christian ministers should just go get honest jobs, and all Christians ought to join another religion. Um, St. Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, 
your faith is in vain, and we are the most pitiable of people. There really is no third option. See, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then the whole thing is a fraud and a joke. If he has been raised from the dead, then he is who he says he is, and he must become the absolute center of our lives. C.S. Lewis was right about that. There is no real third option of, oh, I don't think he rose from the dead, but he's a great moral teacher. No, no. If he didn't, didn't rise from the dead, Christianity is a fraud and a joke. That's how central it is. Now, having seen the, the importance of the facticity of the resurrection, what lessons can we draw from it? Well, of course, probably a thousand, but I'll just draw three today. So here's the first lesson. This world is not it. Now, I want to be careful because I don't mean this world is bad. I don't mean we should be ignoring it. What I mean is the world of our ordinary experience, the world of immediate common sense, the world, if you want, of modern secularism. You know, we're the first culture, they say, really in the history of, of humankind that is largely accepting a secularist view of the world. That's just this world. This is it. The resurrection is saying in no uncertain terms that this world, though good, is not the final horizon of what is real. It tells us, as the Bible puts it, that God's about the business of making a new heavens and a new earth. He wants to raise up and transfigure this world. And the resurrection is the great indication of the truth of this. You know, here's something I think is self-evidently true. I think Jean-Paul Sartre and his colleagues, the existentialists, are, are dead right when they say, if there is no God, life is absurd. That's true. That's true. I mean, we can enjoy things here and there in this even us and passing world, but let's face it, there's no God, we all die and we stay in our graves and that's the end of the story, then life is basically absurd. No matter what I accomplish, it'll eventually fade away, I will fade away, and everyone that ever knew me will fade away. What's the point? Being a morally upright person, you say, well, that's important. Well, I guess, but you know, so someone suffers and dies, I don't do anything about it. The world looks on with utter indifference, and then eventually we all fade away, and then the world fades away. Who cares? Who cares? The, the point is, if you, if you accept a completely secularist view of reality, life is basically uh, meaningless. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead, therefore, is this enormously important sign, enormously powerful sign, that something else is the case, that God is up to something beyond just our ordinary experience. Here's a second great lesson from the resurrection. That tyrants, your time is up. So think what it meant now for the first Christians. Jesus, their friend and master, is put to death by uh, the power of Rome in collusion with certain of the Jewish leadership. The cross was the great sign of Roman tyranny, Roman authority and power. You know, if, if you get in our way, we will do that to you. The cross was meant to be horrific, which is why they displayed them publicly. Think of Spartacus and his colleagues along the Appian Way. Or in Jesus' case, they crucified him right by the, the gate to the city of Jerusalem, so no one would miss him. I was just reading somewhere very recently that uh, historians speculate the cross would have been about 10 feet high, you know, because they wanted it to be seen. It was a sign of Roman tyranny and power. So when God raises Jesus from the dead, what does it say to the first Christians? It says, no, Caesar's power is not final. He's not the ultimate authority. In fact, his tyranny is under judgment. God's love is greater than anything that's in the world. Now watch how very creative Christians have used this insight to very powerful effect up and down the ages. The best example in recent years is John Paul II in Poland. And I think of uh, that scene 1979 in Victory Square in Warsaw and he's preaching the gospel, preaching about God, about human rights, about the resurrection. And the Polish government, the communist government, is right behind him. And behind them, symbolically, was the full force of the Soviet Empire. The only thing John Paul had, he had no guns, he had no armies or tanks. But right next to him was this giant cross. See, the cross has always been a taunt to tyrants. It's a way of saying to the tyrants, we're not afraid of you. The worst you can do to us, God is more powerful than that. And John Paul, like all the other great uh, Christian social activists over the centuries, knew the power of the cross. That's why we shouldn't privatize it. 
the, the secular society today wants us to privatize the cross. It's our, it's our little symbol of our little peculiar hobby called Christianity. No, no, the cross is meant to be, as it was 2,000 years ago, erected publicly. It's meant to be in the public eye. And we Christians have to keep doing that because the tyrants have to know their time is up. Here's a third lesson I'll draw from the resurrection. That the way of hope opens to everybody. Why do I say that? Well, think of the cross is the journey of the Son of God all the way to the limits of God forsakenness. The Father sends the, sends the Son into the world all the way to death. And Paul says, even death on a cross, which is the worst way they could imagine anyone dying. The point is, the Son is sent all the way out to the very limits of human suffering, even, yes, to the point of God forsakenness. So when Jesus says on the cross, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, what's the point of that? What's the point of it? The point is he sent all the way out to get everybody, everyone who's wandered far away from God, look, is now gathered in by the Son. So as you run as fast as you can away from the Father, where are you running? You're running into the arms of the Son. See, that's what it means, the, the outstretching of the Trinitarian persons. And then in the resurrection, when the Son in the Spirit returns to the Father, he returns, in principle anyway, gathering the whole world. And that's why the way of hope opens up to everybody. When people are tempted to say, and I hear it a lot in my pastoral ministry, oh, look, I mean, God could never forgive me for what I did. Uh, I, I've been so bad. I mean, it, it, it don't even bother me, Father. I mean, God could never forgive me. No, no, God went all the way out. He went into every dark corner of human experience so that he could draw the whole world back to him. And so that's why the resurrection is a sign of hope. So first lesson, transcendence. There's more to life than meets the eye. Second lesson, the tyrants tremble in the presence of the cross. Third lesson, there's hope for everybody. There's hope even for the most hopeless. Let the power of the resurrection resonate in your own heart and announce it to a waiting world. Well, there you have it. I hope that this uh, short explanation by Bishop Bern has helped all of us to understand what Easter, what resurrection is about. A uh, reminder to all those of us who are Christians, sometimes we wonder, we associate Easter with just uh, chocolate bunny and uh, eggs. There is place for it, but that does, doesn't have much to do with it. But above all is celebrating Christ who has rose from the dead and then living this faith. Now uh, we'll present the prayer of the faithful. As, we've joyfully, as we joyfully celebrate the resurrection of Christ, let us remember the true meaning of Easter. And the response to our petition is, Lord, hear our prayer. Easter is love. It is the assurance that God loves us through his risen Son with love that survives even death itself. May we spread this love wherever we go. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Easter is light. May each of us carry the light of Easter in our homes, school communities, and the wider world. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Easter is hope. Our hope is in the risen Christ. May we recognize that he is with us in all our daily tasks. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Easter is the gift of life. In rising from the dead, Jesus has given us life. We pray that God, God's gift of life be treasured by all, and that all human life be respected and protected. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Easter is peace. We pray that the peace of the risen Christ heals the wounds of violence, terrorism, and injustice, so that peace and justice may flourish in our world, in our homes, and in our hearts. At this time, we pray particularly for the peace in Ukraine. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Easter is heaven. We pray that all who died in Christ may enter eternal life, won from us by Christ. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Easter is joy. Let us share this joy with family, friends, and all in our school today. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. 
We joyful hearts, we bow our heads and remember in silence our own intentions and intentions of those who have asked for our prayers. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. As with one voice, we proclaim the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Loving God, Hear the prayer of your people as we celebrate with joy the resurrection of your Son, and grant to all humanity the peace that makes us live as one body. And whatever we do, in word and in deed, may we do everything in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. May the risen Lord bless us, protect us from our evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Thank you to Giselle, Rachel, Seymour crew, and to all of you for those few minutes, and have a blessed day and a holy week.